Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in a moment as soon as we see um, that all of our pan all of our um, participants uh, come online. I see the numbers going up rather rapidly here. And wow, I see we have a great level of attendance. Welcome to everybody. This is uh, the last um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, Dean seminar um, for this calendar year. And in opening it, I especially want to thank uh, Tania Valmore, who um, worked uh, with the Dean's office to organize this, as well as Natasha Kazim, who is the, the leader of our DEI uh, committee uh, for uh, the efforts that have allowed us to bring this forward today. And I'm especially thrilled that today we have this topic um, of maternal mortality. Many of you know that it, as a pediatrician that early on in my career, I worked on um, what may seem to be a different issue, um, infant mortality, uh, but in reality is, is a part of the same continuum. And, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, we humans evolve, you know, to be able to survive from one generation to the next, right? And yet there are numerous stresses that we've always experienced that in particular affect our ability both to have children and to be able to raise children. And so like other animals, <laughs> uh, we biologically adapt to those stresses by, you know, by having certain things happen. Uh, one thing that happens is that at an early stage when we're under a lot of stress, um, we can't even uh, conceive a child, can't even have conception. Um, um, another thing that can happen is that, um, and I apologize for the barking, um, that we can have a conception, but the, the child um, cannot make it through pregnancy, have a miscarriage, or you have a conception, you have a pregnancy, but there's growth restriction. The energy is conserved by, by restricting the growth of the child. The child is born small or maybe even born premature because of the amount of stress that one is under. The last thing that would happen and is the worst biologically is that there is mortality of the mother because after all, when the mother dies, you not only potentially lose that child, but also you lose a caregiver for other children. So strictly from the biological point of view, from the point of view of evolution, that is the last thing that should happen. And all of the rest of the response to stress is about, at the end of the day, protecting the life of the mother, which means that this issue of maternal mortality is one where we're looking at the outer extreme of the kinds of stresses, environmental impacts, if you may, nutritional impacts, other impacts that are adversely affecting reproduction. And, as, and when it comes to racism, therefore also the most extreme versions of that. So I, I'm, I'm very thrilled that we have the opportunity to have this conversation today. We also have with us today, Karen McDonald, and Anita Vias, who are leaders of our new HRSA funded Center of Excellence on Maternal and Child Health. Um, I, in my view, a long overdue recognition of the excellence that we have at the School of Public Health in that area. And we're honored to have two members of our faculty who are national experts in this, but also that we have with us today uh, two um, experts um, from the rest of the university um, who are very important to us. Um, Tony Young, who's one of the newer members of our School of Nursing faculty and somebody who um, is um, also, I think has um, a secondary appointment in the School of Public Health and um, has certainly been um, a leader in this field. Um, we've um, been um, looking forward to uh, figuring out when we're going to be able to start really working with Tony since he arrived here. And this is a, a good time for us to start um, doing this. But also 
from the School of Nursing, Sherry Pollington, who is a tenure track assistant professor and a researcher in health disparities, who not only is an expert in, in this area, but also in oncology and the area of cancer health disparities. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to the members of our panel, starting with Karen McDonald. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you all for being here with us today as we discuss an issue that is integral to our health and well-being, and that is disparity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to maternal and child health, which I'll call MCH for short. I have the pleasure of joining you today as an MCH advocate, researcher, and instructor to the MCH Foundation's course here at the School of Public Health. And I see a lot of our alumni and students are in the participant, are in the attendees, so thank you all for joining. Every fall semester for the past uh, double digit years, I've had the honor to teach our graduate course in the foundations of MCH. So before we get started, what is MCH? MCH is the professional and academic field that focuses on the determinants, mechanisms and systems that promote and maintain the health, safety, well-being, and optimal development of children and their families in our communities, societies, in order to enhance the future health and welfare of society and subsequent generations, as Dean Goldman has related. As we move through the semester, along with our 37 graduate students in the course, we critically thought through where we've been, where we are today, and where we need to go to ensure the health and well being of our population. And in our final class, we tasked ourselves with the questions that guide our webinar today. Why is maternal and infant mortality still a public health problem in the US? And what should we do about it? Well, first, we need the data. While we do have indicators that we use to measure how well we're doing in meeting the health needs of our society, as well as to compare the health of our MCH population with others in the world, we do have one key health indicator that's used. Well, it's actually a key health indicator to represent the health of a population, and that is infant mortality. Infant mortality is the death of a live born infant before reaching the first birthday. This rate is a key indicator that is used as a proxy measure to represent the health of a population. This rate tells us how well we protect our most vulnerable. It's associated with a variety of factors such as maternal health, quality and access to care, socioeconomic conditions, and public health practices. First, the good news. We've made remarkable public health strides to decrease our infant mortality rate, which had been over 100 per 1,000 live births, which is one in 10, a century ago, to now meeting our Healthy People 2020 goal of less than six per 1,000 live births. However, this does translate to over 21,000 deaths in 2018. So where does that place the US compared to other nations? Well, we do spend a lot on healthcare, so that should translate to having the lowest infant mortality rate. Not quite. Are we in the top 10? Sadly, no. Top 20? We aren't even in the top 50. So while we may have met our Healthy People 2020 goal, we have a lot of work ahead of us as we have not met a key goal. And that's where we do need data. We have a long lasting disparity in our infant mortality rates. So when I asked the MCH Foundation's class why this is so, I have to say the responses were informative, evidence-based, and indicative of the diversity, equity, and inclusion that we are gathered here today to discuss. We need to rethink how we go about decreasing disparities and assuring equity by including such things as a life course developmental perspective in our work. We need to broaden our perspectives to include the person, but the person within their social ecological context. We know that when we care about pregnancy only while someone is pregnant, well, that's much too late. We know that while we may all be faced with the same stressors, such as COVID-19, the stress we experience is not the same and the effect of the stress is dependent upon what has come before today. In other words, it's cumulative. We have a term that we use to describe this, weathering. Weathering in MCH describes how the constant exposure to health inequities leads to premature aging, 
and poor health outcomes, such as the dispor disproportionately high rates of infant and maternal mortality. The stress of fighting against systems and structures can indeed have an impact on your health and the health of future generations. So by taking a life course perspective, we can see that this stress is cumulative, that our allostatic load is building and can have a significant and yet preventable role in the public health crisis of the disparities we see as evidenced by the fact that black infants are twice as likely to die before their first birthday. And black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related complications than white women in the US. These disparities matter not just at the time of pregnancy, but we know is that we need to move beyond a single point in time and to move beyond a single explanation. As you will hear from the panelists today, we are moving beyond the lens of the individuals and personal responsibility and expanding our scope to create and ensure equitable, supportive, social, educational, political, and cultural environments. We know that the problem is real. So now what are we gonna do about it? A key step forward is to invest in creating the spaces to have these much needed and difficult conversations such as this one today. We need to elevate the efforts of the organizations tackling these crises, such as the Mayor's National Maternal and Infant Health Summit, and to recognize that stopping maternal and infant deaths is just one part of our goals, as we will hear from our GW team members and from our newly funded MCH Center of Excellence. So while we engage in this conversation, we invite you to put in the chat box, tell us some of the efforts that you're doing in maternal and child health. I now wanna to turn to Dr. Tony Yang as he will continue our exploration into maternal and infant mortality, why it's still a pervasive public health issue and what we are going to do about it. Thank you, Dean Goldman for this opportunity and thank you, Karen, for framing the issue. Uh, could you uh, upload my slide? Great. So um, Sherry and I are here today because we are funded recently by Rabu Johnson Foundation's uh, interdisciplinary uh, research leader program to conduct a study related to maternal health, which Sherry would uh, describe um, in detail. Although I have uh, publications and grants related to maternal child health, I am not an expert like some of you here. Um, this is not an original uh, scientific um, presentation as our project has just started. And what I am about to present is not really new if you have taken Karen's course and have other uh, maternal child background. But hope this uh, presentation helps uh, raise some awareness for folks relatively new to this topic and generate interdisciplinary uh, collaboration in the GW community. Next slide, please. So this is our uh, project team. Um, this is uh, three year projects covering 20% of our time each. Uh, we are uh, partnering with uh, DC community organizations, and we have a, a research assistant who's a MPH student actually at Milken. Um, next slide, please. So my part has uh, four key points, data, disparities, and why this is a public health problem, and why there's a larger issue before Sherry dives into our projects. Uh, next slide, please. Here's, uh, you can see US uh, maternal mortality ratio per 100,000 births compared to countries with more than 300,000 births. And we are at the bottom, unfortunately. Next slide, please. Trends uh, for US versus uh, comparable OECD countries, while they, uh, decreased 19%, we increased 2% over a recent uh, 16 years time period, comparing to Australia, Canada, France, uh, Germany, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Spain, and UK. In 1986, when CDC began tracking maternal death, 
seven women for every thousand, a hundred thousand libraries die during pregnancy, during childbirth, or in the weeks and months following. By 2016, the annual rate has jumped to 17 women for every 100,000 libraries. Uh, according to CDC statistics, 50,000 women face dangerous complications from pregnancy and childbirth. Think about all the medical advances that have occurred in recent times, and yet the risk associated with the pregnancy have not declined. This figure say to me, uh, we are failing women during what should be a most wondrous time mm -hmm. of their life. And no developed nation has more disappointing record, unfortunately. Next slide, please. So if we stratify U.S. ratio to white mothers, um, the U.S. Uh, was still ranked behind most almost all other comparable countries. So by even a more conservative standard, uh, the US fares poorly in international comparisons. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see uh, maternal mortality by race over 50 years data. Uh, there's a huge racial disparity. Blue lines uh, representing the black uh, is consistently higher. Um, next slide, please. This figure shows US infant and uh, maternal mortality, black uh, to white ratios. You can see uh, in recent years, uh, blacks uh, infant and maternal mortality are at least two to three times larger than white infant maternal mortality. Next slide, please. Here, um, pregnancy-related uh, mortality ratio by race, um, again, uh, show huge disparity. Next slide, please. Pregnancy-related mortality ratios by education uh, level, um, black versus white. I think it's, um, uh, could you go back to one more slide, one slide? Um, no, uh, go back, sorry, yeah, this one. So, um, so unfortunately, black mothers with college degree fare worse than white mothers without uh, high school diplomas. Uh, next slide, please. Let's look at the timing of uh, pregnancy-related death. Only one third of the death occur uh, during the day of the delivery and within six days uh, postpartum. About two thirds of the death occur during the pregnancy in between seven days uh, and one year postpartum. So this showed that maternal death are not just a clinical care issue. And this is also a series of public health issues. Next slide, please. And let's look at the cost-specific uh, proportionate uh, pregnancy-related mortality over time. More clinical-related ones are dropping. And then, um, you know, the causes that uh, public health intervention could play a role are uh, increasing. Next slide, please. Also, um, also Let's look at the underlying causes of uh, pregnancy-related death by timing of death. This is also show that uh, uh, public health interventions could play a critical role. The CDC examined the factors behind this spike in maternal death, um, basically heart disease, hemorrhage, and infections um, appear most frequently on death certificates. The upstream issues includes um, lack of access to care, unstable housing, limited access to transportation, poor understanding of uh, danger size, and not following medical advice. The CDC also signed um, health, uh, health systems e ill-equipped to deal with a maternal emergency miss or delay uh, diagnosis and poor cause uh, case uh, collab and coordinations. 
most heartbreaking is that uh, the CDC conclusions um, that six of every 10 maternal death that occur can be prevented. Basically with better and more accessible healthcare for all, many will be alive today. So there needs to be an investment in the public health uh, infrastructure, as well as um, women's health when they are not pregnant. Uh, just echo what Karen just say. Next slide, please. So maternal mortality is the, uh, the tip of iceberg uh, on uh, women's health. Maternal death uh, account for about 1% of all death uh, to women uh, 15 to 49 in the US. The death rate for women 15 to 49 has not improved. You can look at the graph here. Focusing only on pregnancy will not solve the problems of maternal mortality in the US. I recommend uh, this op-ed by uh, Jing and Neil, uh, two leading scholar on this topic. Also, there's a huge uh, geographic disparity. The figure in the middle show maternal mortality ratio by state. Where is it, DC? Uh, it's the bar with highest, highest number, unfortunately. It made me sad that uh, among uh, 40, uh, 51 states plus DC, the home location of GWU, uh, which is DC, uh, ranked at the very bottom. Mm. How to address this issue uh, is complicated. Um, e uh, key is a combined clinical public health and policy response. Basically, it requires uh, multi-level approaches, including getting more male involvement and training more maternal child workforce, which Sherry and Amida will discuss further. To quickly sum up my four points here, number one, we are not doing well historically and compared to OECD country. Number two, huge racial disparity exists and probably uh, COVID make it even worse. Number three, maternal death are a public health issue as much as a clinical issue. Fourth, uh, the issue is broader than uh, just maternal mortality, which require multi-level approaches. Next slide, please, and share your up. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dean Goldman and Karen and Tony for giving us such wonderful background. And really what, what we have described here is what I refer to as a wicked problem. The literature describes wicked problems as multidimensional, as Tony and Karen said, as multi-level. And there are just so many uh, uh, complex things that we have to consider when we have uh, complex wicked problems such as this. So Robert Woods Johnson Foundation through their interdisciplinary uh, research leaders program is making an investment in looking at maternal mortality. And so we know that there are multiple factors across different levels contribute to maternal mortality and the racial ethnic disparities in the United States. Um, just some additional background, uh, black mothers are three to four times as likely to die from pregnancy related deaths as non-black women. But when we think about this huge problem, the question is what role do fathers play? in reducing maternal mortalities. Involved fathers can play critical roles in children's health and development from the prenatal period through adolescence. Mothers were 1.5 times more likely to receive prenatal care in the first trimester when the father was involved. And fathers can support mothers in breastfeeding, following infant safe sleep guidelines and further reducing deaths. Next slide. So we looked at the, Tony has presented a great job with the national data, but it does. It's so sad that DC just has this huge wicked problem, you know, in our neighborhoods. DC's pregnant related mortality rate has been consistently higher than the US pregnancy related mortality rate. Next slide. So when we think about pregnancy-related mortality deaths, we see that from this uh, chart that Black women with at least a college degree was five times as high in white women with similar education. 
And that's really a startling fact. And what is it about college educated women? There's some recent work by um, uh, Keisha Bentley Edwards at Duke University in her wonderful report, Fighting at Birth, Eradicating the Black White Infant Mortality Gap. And basically what she looks at is that looks at the intersectionality of both gender and race and also sexism and racism. Next slide. And so here again, uh, this data, pregnancy related mortality by race and ethnicity for the District of Columbia shows us that black women con consider to fare uh, very poorly in terms of pregnancy related um, mortality deaths. Next slide. So what are we trying to do? Um, recently, uh, Tony and I, with our wonderful community partner, Clayton Rosenberg, who I think is joining us today, we wanted to look at um, what role does father involvement play? But we know that there are many systematic barriers, uh, lack of paid family leave, out-of-pocket costs, inflexible work hours for medical appointments, and various social stereotypes that impact father involvement. Next slide, thank you. So when it comes to paid family leave, past research does show that paid family leave has a positive impact on parents and children. Currently only six states have paid family leave. The DC paid family leave began administering on July 1st, 2020 and provides eight weeks to bond with the new child six weeks to care for a family member with a serious health condition, and two weeks to care for your own serious health condition. Next slide, thank you. So in our study, one of the things we wanted to do was really use formative um, and experiential data using key informant interviews and focus groups, uh, knowledge, and then we also will be doing a visual research method using photo voice um, and a cross-sectional survey um, to look at father involvement among fathers in DC wards six, seven, and eight. And some of our frameworks, we're gonna look at the health belief model, use the social ecological model, and also look at how ideas around father involvement diffuse in communities. And our target population um, is Black fathers 18 years and older in DC communities. Next slide. So our study data collection consists of various uh, variables we want to look at, um, social demographic factors, religiosity, perceived stress, health literacy, maternal mortality awareness, barriers to preventive services, life events, um, incarceration, awareness of paid family leave, trust in the healthcare system, and of course, father involvement. And then our dependent variables, we wanna look at our maternal mortality and then knowledge attitudes and behaviors regarding the role of black fathers in the reduction of maternal mortality. Next slide. So we're doing all of this formative data collection in the hopes of developing what we call FIT, the Father Involvement Training Educational Intervention, where we want to pilot this intervention that will provide education to fathers to help them create and maintain a healthy, positive environment before, during, and after pregnancy, and educate them about the danger signs to prevent uh, maternal mortality. Um, again, as Tony and I both said, this study was funded by the Robert Wish Johnson Foundation. We were one of 15 teams across the U.S. and um, our D.C. team, as well as the Massachusetts team, both are uh, focusing on the role of fathers in reducing maternal mortality. Thank you. Um, our research project questions look at what are fathers' perceptions regarding their roles in reducing maternal mortality? How do system level factors promote and impede fathers' roles in reducing maternal mortality and disparities? And what are fathers' experiences and perceived effects of the 
newly adopted DC paid leave in reducing maternal mortality. So our goals are to highlight the fact that solutions in the reduction of maternal mortality must include fathers, show collaboration between policymakers, healthcare systems, organizations, and provider communities, and families must exist. We also hope to examine relationships among father involvement and relevant factors that promote or impede father involvement in reducing maternal mortality assess father involvement during pregnancy and throughout the life of the child as an important factor for building strong families, and then also bring attention to the issue, identify gaps and barriers to father involvement, and help um, it actionable, develop actionable strategies, practices, policies, and interventions at multiple levels. And I really want to thank, thank our wonderful community partner, um, Clayton Rosenberg with the Alliance of Concerned Men. We have worked very closely with him. Um, and, and everyone always says, says it's important that we involve communities. And really, a lot of the solutions are found in our community. So I really uh, want to thank our community partner for, for all of their help. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you so much to all of the previous panelists for um, so beautifully setting the landscape, not just of maternal and infant mortality in the US, but um, in Washington, DC, a place that we all care very deeply about. So um, as the previous panelists have shared, despite the significant gains over the last decades, there's still lots of work that needs to be done, um, especially for those who are socially and economically disadvantaged and marginalized. Um, as an academic institution committed to meeting MCH challenges, including maternal and infant mortality, it's also very clear that we need a highly trained interdisciplinary workforce of practitioners, policy experts, and scientists. And we need this workforce to address issues such as infant mortality through a social justice lens with a deep understanding that racism and gender discrimination are at the core of so many MCH disparities including maternal and infant deaths. And we need a workforce who has a deep understanding that infant mortality and maternal deaths do not occur within a vacuum, but is both a precursor and a consequence towards the health and well-being of women across the lifespan. So to that end, um, I love sharing with all of you, and I, I love that I get to announce this, that we have been awarded a five-year grant from HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Um, and we just recently launched the new GW Center of Excellence in Maternal and Child Health. Uh, we are one of 13 outstanding MCH programs across the country, all really working to ensure that we have a strong pipeline of professional and academic talent to help serve the needs of women, infants, and children. And while all 13 centers across the country focus on education, science, and practice, we're the only center of excellence to also have a core focus on policy as well. Um, and that is really in much credit to the MCH policy experts in our Department of Health Policy here at the school. And I just wanna recognize Drs. Ann Marcus and Susan Wood and Liz Borkowski for leading our policy core. You know, as we were conceptualizing our center and the training that we wanted to put forth, it was really important to us that our center be firmly rooted in our shared values and principles. And some of those included things like learning by doing, ensuring that our students and our trainees are not just given basic education around maternal and child health, but really sort of a skills-based approach to their learning, including experiential training. Uh, we wanted to promote a culture of service um, we think that that's really important to our work. And of course, embracing social justice and diversity in our MCH mission. And going beyond just using those words, we're really operationalizing that across all of the different pillars of our center. 
And finally, we wanted to ensure that our center would not only capitalize on the incredible resources of our location in Washington, DC, right? A location that gives students proximity and access to you know, federal agencies, national agencies, nonprofit organizations working in maternal and child health, but that we would focus our efforts in addressing maternal and child health right here in our home region. Um, we have an incredible team of people at the core of our center who have been working hard over the last several months to operationalize our mission. And despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we've already launched several new initiatives at the center. And I'm just gonna very quickly share a few of what those initiatives are. Uh, most recently, we've established new partnerships and MOUs with the Maryland Department of Health's Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Uh, a new partnership with our very own DC Department of Health and their Title V MCH program. And in both of these partnerships, both our students and our faculty will be providing technical assistance uh, and research across multiple projects, uh, including around maternal health and infant mortality. Uh, we expect our local health department partnerships to really grow over the next year. We've been discussing with many of our local health departments across Virginia, Maryland, and DC that we really need a regional approach to maternal and child's health. And we believe that can really be a game changer in thinking about maternal and child health. As we all know, people live and work across the city and different counties in our region. And so by joining forces together, to really design a vision and an implementation plan for a regional approach, we believe that could really have some you know, real meaningful impact. And I wanna pay great credit to Professor Don Strong, who's really been leading our partnerships with these local health departments. Um, our professional development team under the leadership of Professor Jerry Franz is launching two new skill building workshops for our MCH trainees. One is around human-centered design. And I think this is incredibly innovative. You know, when we talk about building an interdisciplinary workforce, we need to look to our colleagues over in business and entrepreneurship to really, you know, think about how we can co-train and learn new skills so that we can develop new innovations and new ways of thinking about the problem, but also thinking about the solutions. Uh, we're also developing a policy and advocacy workshop for all of our uh, MCH trainees so that every single trainee of ours will know no matter what your position is within an MCH organization or public health organization, you will know how to do advocacy both at the local as well as at the national level. Um, and just a few weeks ago, we launched two new initiatives under what uh, under the center. The first is a systematic observation of mask adherence and distancing. This is a study that we're doing in partnership with researchers from Kaiser Permanente and the RAND Corporation to enhance surveillance of masking and distancing behaviors, uh, given that those are so important to controlling COVID-19. And the information and data that we're collecting from our local residents here in the DC region will be accessible to local health departments, elected officials, and others to really think about better decision making around the pandemic. So we have a team of faculty and students who are collecting this data in key locations, such as commercial streets, neighborhood parks, uh, play areas, and walking paths. And we're really focused on maternal and child health populations with this work that we're doing. The second project that we've embarked on is with one of our community partners, the Beacon House. They are a community-based after-school education and youth development nonprofit organization in Ward 5. And their focus is really around decreasing and closing the educational gap of children in Ward 5. So we have a team of students and faculty who are developing a set of holistic interventions to address the mental health and well-being of the families that they serve. And um, I'd just like to say a big thanks uh, to Drs. Monica Ruiz and Dr. McDonald, who's one of our panelists here today for leading those two initiatives. And finally, I just wanna end with, you know, the last nine months has certainly uncovered and shown light on what we've always known, right? Racism and gender inequity are at the root of adverse maternal and child health outcomes and for health disparities for girls and women across the lifespan. And as we move forward as a field, we must redefine and re-examine health through a lens of social, 
racial and gender justice. And it's my hope that our new center will really transform how our workforce addresses this and ultimately transforms maternal and child health outcomes, especially right here in our own hometown of Washington, DC. I can see from the list of uh, attendees here today, lots of colleagues, lots of our students and alums, and I invite all of you to join us and to join the center um, in addressing maternal and child health here in Washington, DC. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, uh, uh, you know, Amita, Karen, and especially our, our wonderful guests, Sherry and Tony. Um, I think that uh, we have a couple of people who are monitoring the questions in the chat box, but I'm already starting to see some. And I thought maybe um, I would start um, with a couple of them, uh, a point that came up very early, which is that um, our rates um, um, for both infant and, and maternal mortality being quite high in comparison with other highly industrialized countries and rich countries, the so-called rich countries, that yet our rates are, are, are fairly near the bottom of those countries. We must be the richest country. But um, are there things we could be learning from developing countries? Or that was the question, but I'd also say from other rich countries, what could we be learning um, from them and in terms of um, our higher rates of both infant and uh, maternal mortality? I'll start with that one. Um, so one of the things that we have talked about uh, in our class, and, and maybe Tony, you can um, help out with this, is we, we need more data, we need better data, and we also need to think about what happens after birth. It also in terms of like the fourth, the fourth trimester, we need to take our existing policies and do better by them. Um, of course, uh, some, some would say we need to throw all of that out the window and start anew, but we got to work with what we have. Uh, and so even just having a um, changing how we do postpartum care, I think is going to be a, 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 a realistic first step. Pay attention to mental health. Pay attention to women's voices. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what people are experiencing. Don't just think because you have the health degree that you know better. Um, we have to really listen to people, find out what their needs are. They know themselves better than anyone um, and engage in having policies that really do have, I think what Sherry and Tony are trying to do and that's more of um, a family centered and or community centered approach to, you know, in the short term, deal with maternal and infant uh, mortality, but in the longer term, those are actually rare circumstances. There are many more common circumstances in terms of severe, mor severe morbidity that we need to be paying attention to as well. But I wanna turn it over to Tony and Sherry and see uh, with your project, how you're, how you're answering this. Oh, thank you, Karen. You, yeah, you pretty much answer all the <laughs> so suggestion I might have. So um, I'll just highlight two points uh, you mentioned about data and listening to women. So we definitely need to find um, kind of a systematic uh, process for listening to women, telling us about their lives and experience in pregnancy and beyond and to craft a sustainable uh, solution uh, that are meaningful to them. And then for the data, uh, try to use, uh, say, maternal mortality review committees to explore uh, pregnancy-associated death for causes and possible basis for prevention. And then use linked data sets to examine um, women's health through their life course and identify critical um, uh, moments like pregnancy and where the intervention might matter. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, this is no magic bullets. I just have to, you know, uh, just have to do them. So. Yeah, and I, I would just add to what um, Tony and Karen shared that I think, you know, we have made great strides. Yeah, we certainly have a long way to go. But two other things that I would add to that is certainly the expansion of Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, particularly here in DC, is one of the reasons I think you know we we did start seeing declines, um, you know, several years ago around maternal deaths and infant deaths. Um, and then the second thing would also be a decrease in unintended pregnancies, 
we've seen nationally as well as here in, in DC, those rates are still very high, almost 50% of pregnancies are unintended, but they have come down quite a bit as well as with teen births. And so I think that's another reason that we've seen some positive gains in terms of maternal and child health. And I, I would say in terms of our project, also realizing the importance of a community-based approach. Um, also, when we talk about uh, providers, not to forget the role of nurses, nurse practitioners, and the role of midwives. There have just been wonderful interventions in the clinical setting with mid, uh, midwives, and we have a wonderful midwifery program in the School of Nursing, wonderful uh, nurse practitioners. And so when we talk about training the next cadre of um, uh, professionals, we, we must also focus on not just you know, physicians, but nurses and midwives as well. And then the community approach, working with uh, grassroots organizations here in the district. Um, I have a wonderful community partner. Many of you probably know uh, Mama Toto and Aza Nahara and the great work that she is doing. She's also a midwife. So I would focus on community-based solutions and that's really important. And then what Dean Goldman said, really focusing on the family as a, a unit of examination. And that's why this role of fathers is so important because they're often left out of the conversation. And that's one of the great things about our project we're bringing fathers into the conversation, training them and educating them on uh, signs and symptoms that they can look for in their wives and partners. And I think so it, it starts at the clinical level, but also going all the way to the family and community level as well. So I have a question actually, and, uh, and this, is a, this is a difficult question, but recently I had um, a member of our board for GW send me um, something they picked up um, in the media, which caused me to then read the study, which was very um, interesting in terms of uh, showing uh, pretty convincingly that maternal mortality and other outcomes it's also very influenced by the race of the physician, mm -hmm. um, the attending physician. And um, how do we address that problem of how even um, um, racism, even if it's unconscious, even if it's unconscious bias can affect um, healthcare um, and what is potentially the role of, of the father and the family members and helping to address that problem as well. And I mean, maybe starting with, with Sherry. Um. Well, uh, Dean Goldman, that's a very good point because what that refers to is a physician patient race concordance. And we've seen how positive uh, that can be in terms of health disparities in many, many areas, chronic disease, certainly that's the case uh, with cancer. And uh, Dr. Lisa Cooper at Johns Hopkins has done a lot of work with cardiovascular disease and videotaping um, the provider patient uh, engagement and seeing how race concordance can make a difference. And say, for, in, for example, those persons who have um, African American uh, providers and they're also African American, um, they seem to be listened to more they have better outcomes. So I think more uh, research is needed for that. And then I think in terms of both mother and father, having both of them involved in the conversation and you know, being an advocate for your own health and wellness. And I think for so long, many patients have felt like, oh, it's the all wise doctor, he knows all, and we cannot question the doctor. But no, you know, educating uh, patients how to make sure that they are empowered to be able to ask those questions, to say, listen, you, you know, my wife is showing symptoms and this is not right, and not just being easily dismissed. Uh, I had a patient tell me 
that they went in to for a consult and the mother was having severe problems uh, during pregnancy. And the, the provider said to her, oh, well, you're having complications because you're, you're pregnant. And just really totally dismissed the symptoms that she was having and later she had severe complications. So I think it's about educating and empowering uh, patients to be advocates for themselves and I think that that's where we see a lot of communities really working to educate families uh, to do that. Yeah, and I would just add to that, you know, Sherry, with what you were saying, you know, it's all, it's about building trust with our healthcare providers, mm -hmm. right? So we need to do more training our, our, as providers. Every, we all need to do a better job. Our systems need to do a better job. Um, but we also really need to be building trust with our communities. You know, we did a study uh, two years ago looking at family planning and women's health uh, in the district. And what we really found was that among those, you know, who are either not using methods of family planning or accessing care, it, it really was about distrust. They just were not making it into the door in terms of the clinics. That we've got some incredible healthcare providers and clinics in the uh, in the city, um, and once women were actually making it in the door, they were doing okay. But there, there's just such distrust that women are actually not even going in to access that care. So we have to be more proactive than reactive in really sort of the messaging that we're putting out into communities to build that trust. And and one final thing I'll say, you know, we have to really support our providers because many providers are saying that when that patient gets in there, they don't really have enough time. And in many healthcare systems, they're being penalized if they spend um, an, an, an exorbitant amount of time with the patient. And so we really need to change that model where providers are expected to get patients in and out in five minutes or so, whatever that time frame is, because it does not give the provider enough time to really listen to the concerns of the a patient. So we need new models, new frameworks uh, from the provider's uh, perspective as well. Uh, turning to, to Tania, Natasha, if they have any questions that they want to uh, bring forth. Sure, I can read um, some from the chat. We have, let's see, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, there's one to the um, panelists. Can you comment on the preponderance of cardiovascular deaths especially among African-American women, are these rates different in pregnant women versus non-pregnant women of the same age? Mm. Ooh, okay. okay. I, I know that when you look across chronic uh, health conditions, um, and many people think the number one killer among African-American women is breast cancer, but actually it's, it's lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. So we know that, that that's an issue, but I'm, I don't know what that rate is, uh, you know, among cardiovascular disease among um, pregnant women, but cardiovascular disease is definitely high. And some of the drivers certainly are stress, hypertension, um, similar to what we discussed earlier today. Maybe I could follow up, Sherry. Um, the one thing that I, there's been a lot of concern about with the higher rate in African American women of, you know, both the cardiovascular um, problems during pregnancy, but also uh, diabetes, pregnancy-associated mm -hmm. diabetes, and and then we look at the immediate uh, mortality around that. But what about long longer-term health risk? It, is there longer-term health risk? Uh, that is being suffered that is maybe contributing to overall higher mortality, not necessarily being attributed to the pregnancy per se, but nonetheless where the, where the pregnancy related risks are involved with that. Um. Mm -hmm. And I agree, and as someone just put in the chat, I think it's Sally, um, because we know some of those issues are related to 
obesity, high BMI, which also uh, relates to uh, diabetes and also cardiovascular disease. So thank you, Sally, for, for that comment. Tania? <laughs> sure. Has the um, next question is, has the center formally partnered with faith-based faith organizations as a means of developing interventions to mitigate adverse outcomes for Black birthing people, as well as developing ways to build community trust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and it's absolutely something that I think we're very committed to doing. So we're just in the first year of our center. Uh, so we're launching these initial partnerships with local health departments, but we've got sort of a list of organ other organizations in the district that we want to partner closely with, including faith-based organizations. They mm -hmm. absolutely play a key role across many different public health issues, but in particular, I think um, uh, maternal and child health. So absolutely, if those of you who are out there are working with those organizations, please do be in touch with us. Um, and that's a great question because there are many churches in DC, Maryland and Virginia, um, my church in particular, Shallow Baptist Church, we have a just robust health ministry. And so you started to see many faith-based organizations uh, developing uh, really what I call just exciting to see um, health ministries in their churches. So that's a great uh, partnership. And one uh, pregnancy um, nonprofit organization that's faith-based in DC is at Capitol Hill Pregnancy mm -hmm. Center. Yeah. Um, I have experience working with them. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the place you should uh, start with. Um, so um, Dr. Tilsch has asked a lot of questions. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at his questions in the chat window, but he, he's particularly fascinated uh, by the epidemiology and, and which was no big surprise, I think for any of us um, who know him, but do any of you wish to respond? I, I think that he's interested in um, whether pregnant versus non-pregnant women, um, the, um, the whether there's still a preponderance of cardiovascular deaths among African-American women. I think he's, uh, he's, sh he's interested in um, the, and, you know, also the issue of the near misses. So we count the deaths, but what about the um, situations, the, the pregnancies where, you know, women almost die, mm -hmm. um, but are rescued. Um, and, you know, do we have a way of doing surveillance for that? Um, <laughs> he also was interested in uh, those data actually, Sherry, that you showed for DC showing declining rates of maternal mortality, which I think he may have addressed that in a sense with your comment about how with the Affordable Care Act, there actually has some been data. increased access to care. There actually has been some yeah. good news. Um, I mean, we, we forget how much the Affordable Care Act did accomplish in terms of providing reproductive care for women and, and opening, up, um, opening up access to care for a lot of populations who really didn't have it prior to the ACA. But. And I think Amita addressed that with uh, her response around the Affordable Care Act, um, I would say Medicaid, and then also prior to the Affordable Care Act, you know, DC had the DC Health Alliance Insurance. All right. Insure, insurance covered the underserved population. And then I also want to say, I know working with DC Department of Health, their Chronic Health Administration um, Bureau, they did a big push and still are trying to do a lot of education out in the community around maternal child health helping people get into many of the federally qualified health centers. I don't want to forget them because they're doing really great work. And one of the things about these federally qualified health centers is that they just have just so much, offer so much care, but something they did, and it, it sounds simple, they have extended, they extended hours prior to uh, the pandemic where, um, parents and families can come in in evening hours. I know I work with Mary Center. They have appointments on Saturdays 
and they have appointments up to, up until like 10 o'clock at night during some weeks. So I think those kinds of things in DC help to see the decline in rate. But again, I really want to say uh, the work that uh, midwives are doing, the education in the communities, and also many of these um, maternal uh, child health uh, advocates and grassroots organizations, they're really coming together um, to fight this problem in DC. And as we all know, it's really embarrassing the rates that we see in, in DC. It's just really uh, sad. And so I think all of those things coming together that help some of the rates in D DC decline. And I know that education um, is only one factor in one piece, but it starts there. So we must continue to educate. And I think what um, that's what we're trying to do, but because fathers have often been left out of that picture and interventions, we wanna take a family approach. Wonderful. Well, I thank everybody for attending. I thank uh, uh, our speakers, uh, Tony and Sherry. I thank Amita and Karen. I know that your new Center of Excellence is going to make sure that we have many sessions like this. There's, I can tell from the questions in the chat window that there are far more issues that we can and should delve into um, yes. with this community. And so thanks to you all. And um, have a wonderful day. We'll resume these after the new year. Thank you for the pleasure. Thank you.